from a talk that was all about people. Now we're talking about technology. We have Hugh and Alistair up. Both of these people have done many, many things in a very large variety of areas, so I'm not even going to try and cover it. Today, they are giving us an update on the state of open ISAs, and they will touch on a variety of announcements that have come out during the last 12 months since the Open ISA mini conference at LCA 2020. This is a pre recorded presentation. If you've got questions during the recording, write them in the Venulus chat. Our speech speakers are watching the chat and they will be part of the conversation. After the pre recorded presentation, we're not going to be doing a live QA with them, but they're in the chat, so it's going to be great. Take it away, Hugh and Alistair. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Hugh Blemings, and uh, on behalf of uh, Alistair Francis and uh, myself, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the session today talking about Open ISAs, both RISC-V uh, and, uh, and Open Power. Just some quick introductory remarks, I guess a little bit of a level set, uh, as you're hopefully aware. Instruction set asks, architectural ISA is the part of the overall uh, computing stack that defines the low-level instructions, architecture, and other key characteristics of a modern, modern CPU. Uh, if that's not your understanding of what an ISA is about, then perhaps now is the time to listen to a different talk. But I digress, I jest, of course. The reason we can have this conversation at all is really a testament to the, the broader open technical commons and, in fact, and the open, open overall open source community, and in particular, the parts of that community that have driven the rapid progress of open hardware further up the stack. So sort of things like Arduino, uh, KiCad for developing print circuit boards, they're all sort of a little hurt higher up the stack, but the enthusiasm and the success of those uh, hardware and software endeavours has um, encouraged work to foster the tools required to do FPGA, ASIC, and of course, direct silicon development. Now, this is sort of an entire talk in its own right, just the progress of that and how far it's come in such a, really such a short space of time, building on the effort of many years prior, perhaps, as it might be. But... Um, just to give a bit of a call out to some particularly interesting areas or particularly interesting projects that I think are worth having a look at in addition to those you'll hear about in the coming coming minutes. Uh, Open Lane IO, FUSOC, uh, Next PNR and Renode all being sort of uh, environments for FPGA and ASIC development in particular and, and as well as rapid prototyping. The Skywater PDK, um, which is a processor development kit which uh, is basically putting all it, bringing an open source tool chain to actually lay to pop silicon out on a wafer at the other end, teaming up with things like eFablets who actually do the fabrication of um, uh, chips themselves. And the target for their program at the moment is 130 nanometers, but uh, there's a word on the streets that uh, smaller geometries are, are being discussed, which will get us to even faster and smaller smaller parts. So some really interesting stuff happening, happening there. One overarching aspect I think of this whole this whole thing though is that the success of open source software I believe makes it really does say that the, it's inevitable that we'll see open hardware at every level of the stack as being all but a inevitability. Anyway enough of my introductory remarks um, I'll uh, hand over to Alistair or Sieg through to Alistair's uh, presentation now he's going to walk us through the latest on RISC-V. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alistair and I work at Western Digital as part of the RISC-V software research team. And today I'm going to talk about the RISC-V part of the Open ISA talk at LCA. So today I'm going to start off with things I guess a little differently than previous RISC-V talks. So because RISC-V was talked about last year at LCA as part of the Open ISA's mini conference, and because the RISC-V summit was held you know, just a month and a half ago, and hopefully those videos should be available by the time you're watching this. I'm gonna kind of cover some different topics. I'm not gonna talk about what RISC-V is. I think there's a lot of videos about that online. If you're interested in that, you should go watch some of those. Uh, I'm gonna give a very quick software overview because that's always up to, you know, always changing. I'm gonna give some interesting extensions, extensions I think are interesting. And I'm quickly gonna cover some RISC-V boards. And then I'm gonna talk about three projects that I think are only possible with open ISAs. So these are projects that you know we couldn't do with traditional proprietary closed sourced ISAs um, and these are interesting cool open source projects that are possible now. So first off, the RISC-V software. So we're pretty much done. 
don't tell my boss, but software is almost always done. And then we can all move on and we don't have to do any more work. So that's you know not actually how it works, but the RISC V software really is coming along. So there was a full talk at the, at the RISC V summit. Uh, Arun talked about the state of the union, the software state of the union. Uh, so if you want full details, you should go watch that. Uh, but for me, I'm just gonna cover the really in the Linux kind of ecosystem, um, open source, everything is kind of get, coming together now. So we have uh, upstream, all the things like U-Boot, you know, Linux, QMU, uh, Grub, all of those. And then as well as that, we have all the tool chains, you know, glibc, uh, gcc, LLVM, everything like that. And we have distros, so Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE, uh, BuildRoot, Open Embedded, all have support as well. And then we even have things like the more modern languages like Rust and Go have RISC-V support. So RISC-V really is coming along in terms of, in terms of ecosystem support. Uh, so there's a few software efforts undergoing that don't yet, aren't yet there. And all four of these were talked about at the RISC-V Summit. So that's Android, Java, V8, and OpenJDK. I'm not gonna go into details here. Um, if you wanna know more, go watch the videos at the RISC-V Summit. Or normally all these projects have some sort of you know, RISC-V support bug tracking issue created, and that's always the best place to go because that's always up to date and maintained by the projects. So the RISC-V extensions. So the way RISC-V works is the base ISA is actually very small, you know, just handles adding and, and loading and stores. And then we add extensions on top of that. So multiply, for example, comes from the multiply extension. And so here are three extensions that I think, are, well, three extensions in a working group that I think are very interesting and kind of coming along and close to being frozen. So the way RISC-V extensions work is they have three main states. So we have draft, and a draft extension is you know, subject to change, like an RFC. Don't base a hardware design off this because it could change at any time. Um, and then, but that's where all the discussion happens, right? So someone puts out a proposal and, and we iterate on that and go from there. And then we have the frozen. So frozen is where a s extension has two hardware implementations. Everyone's kind of happy that it's in a good state and then we can freeze it. And then there's a 45 day freeze period before we move on to ratification. And ratification is where it's signed off by and kind of fully endorsed by the RISC-V Foundation. So all four of these are still draft, uh, but well, three in a, in, in a working group are still draft, um, but they're coming along. So the hypervised extension we've been talking about for a while now uh, my colleagues and I have worked on QMU, KVM, and XVisor support. So we have now hypervisors, we have implementation in QMU, and there's now hardware support. Um, so the hypervisor extension should be close to being frozen this year. As well as that, we have the Vector extension. There's a lot of interest in this. Um, it should accelerate you know, machine learning applications and things like that. Uh, and there's, I think, implementations in LLVM uh, and other tool, and maybe at GCC, so the tool chains are there, um, and there's hardware implementations as well. So the vector extension is coming along, and the bit manipulation extension is an interesting one. So we allow, uh, you know, you can use it to do implement bit manipulation in single instructions. So this is useful for obviously a performance overhead, especially for embedded systems, but also as a, actually as a code size reduction, um, because currently some bit manipulation can happen in multiple instructions while this extension would allow you to compress it down to a single one. Uh, so I haven't followed that one as closely, but I think they just released the latest version of their draft spec, and hopefully that's coming along as well. And so the T working group is actually not really an extension, but the trusted execution environment working group works on a lot of security related things. Uh, and the latest one from them that is really interesting is EPMP. So PMP is what, is what RISC-V uses to protect uh, the privilege modes. So the most privileged mode, M mode, can set up PMP to protect itself from other modes. This is um, largely used for embedded systems where you don't have an MMU and you can do either some sort of privilege separation. So you can have unprivileged code or, or user code or something running unprivileged or bootloaders use it to kind of lock themselves off from future boot stages. So, you know, your operating system can't change it and modify your bootloader. Uh, so EMPMP extends this add some missing functionality, uh, and it's pretty exciting, especially for some of the secure applications I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. So RISC-V boards. 
everyone always asks about Risk Five boards. As a QMU person, I think just run on QMU. Uh, QMU is probably just as quick. It's easier to debug and it's cheap, well, basically free. Uh, so, but people seem to have an obsession with running their actual CPU cores on silicon. So, if you're one of those people and you want to run silicon, there's a few options. I'm mostly going to talk about Linux capable ones. So that's the Hi5 Unmatched from Sci5, uh, which is the Sci5 U5, sorry, U740 SoC. There's the Micro Semi, which is in the picture here, and that's Sci5's FU540 core, but they've also combined it with an integrated FPGA. So it's a pretty cool board. And that other here pictured is the Micro Semi board, but there's actually a few different boards on CrowdSupply all using the same SoC. So the Pico Rico was announced at the RISC V Summit and that should be more details coming about it this year. Then there's the ESP uh, 320, uh, sorry, 32, which is Expressif's, uh, you know, ESP line with a RISC-V core. So that one's not Linux capable. And there's the Kendrite. So the Kendrite demo was actually showed last year at LCA as part of the OpenISA's mini conference. And it's a 64-bit CPU that technically does have an MMU, but it doesn't meet the latest privilege spec, so we don't use it. And we run Linux, we run a no MMU Linux. It has eight megabytes of SRAM. So there's not a lot you can do, but I think the whole board is about $12. Um, so it's one of the cheapest boards out there, especially one that boots Linux. So that's the end of um, my kind of overview, my quick overview. And so now I'm gonna talk about some interesting projects. Like I mentioned at the start, these are things that I think could only exist with open ISAs, or at least in the current form. So FuseSock's first. So FuseSock describes itself as a package manager for SOCs. So the Olaf, the guy who, who wrote it, has a lot of good talks. If you want technical details, watch those. Um, but basically he describes it as an apt, a cargo, or a Python pip for SOCs. So where, how it works is you package up IPs um, in a way FuseSock understands, and the FuseSock can take all of those IPs and combine them together and then generate outputs for whatever you're targeting. So for example, if you wanted to combine these groups of IPs, you can do that. And then FuseSock will generate the output for Verilator if you want to run it in Verilator. Or it will generate the output for Vivado if you want to put it onto a Xilinx FPGA. So for software people, this seems a little weird because we're kind of used to, you can just you know, write your software and compile it with GCC or LLVM. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's not exactly that simple, but but it doesn't matter too much. But few, but in the hardware world, that's not the case, right? The, the tool chains all different, and the vendor implementations, and, and this is kind of a mess. Um, a few saw kind of encapsulates all that and generates the outputs for you. And so there's two projects using this that I'm going to talk about. It's Open Titan and Swervel. So Open Titan first. So Open Titan is an open source silicon root of trust. So it's backed by a large group of you know, companies, universities, and nonprofits, things like Low Risk, ETH Zurich, uh, Google, Nuviton, and Western Digital. And Open Titan uses the IVEX, which is a 32-bit RISC-5 core, as its main processor. And then they attach IP blocks. So you know the basic ones like UART and GPIO, as well as more security-related ones like AES and HMAC. And using all of this, they are fully open source root of trust. So the core, the RISC V core is open, the hardware or the IP is open source, the boot ROM is open source, and the software on top of that, the embedded operating system written in Rust is open source as well. So this whole project is an open source root of trust. And this is the type of thing you couldn't do with a traditional proprietary ISA. Imagine that maybe you could you know, open source the IP, but you have to sign an NDA to get the core or pay royalties or something like that. But with open ISAs, we allow the whole project to be open. So Swervolf is the other one. So Swerve, or the other FuseSoc one I'm gonna talk about. So Swervolf is the FuseSoc one SOC for the Swerve core or Swerve EH1 core. So the EH1 is a RISC-V core developed by Western Digital. It's now part of an open source by Western Digital. It's now part of the Chips Alliance project. And Swervolf attaches peripherals like UART, SPY, memory, and things like that uh, to the core. And so it allows you to run you know, Zephyr and the other embedded uh, code on top of it. And here's kind of a little diagram of what it looks like. And that's available as part of the Chips Alliance website. 
And the same thing as I said before, this is the type of thing we could not ever have done with the traditional proprietary ISAs. So Vexris 5 and Litex is the next thing. So Litex is kind of similar to Fusoc. Uh, it's an infrastructure to create SOCs uh, with or without cores. And Vexris 5 is a customizable RISC 5 implementation. So first off, Vexris 5 is this kind of uses this JSON-like language to describe what CPU core you want. So you can say, I want a core with atomics and security, secure mode, oh, sorry, and privilege, a supervisor mode, and PMP, and, but no MMU, and you know, spit that out. Um, and you can kind of customize it based on what you want to do and how much size you have in your, your FPGA or your ASIC. And combined with LightX, which uses mid-gen and, and MySoC, I think that's how you say those, you can generate full SOCs. So LightX has a group of cores uh, you can see here, and then it has Midgen and an FPGA toolchain, and it kind of packages them all together uh, with some inputs like board files to generate everything you need. So this is what FOMU uses. So FOMU is one of Tim Ansel's projects, and it's an FPGA that fits in the USB port of your computer. And that's what that uses for the RISC-5 cores on there. And next thing, the precursor also uses this. So the precursor was announced at last year's LCA by Bunny and Sean, and it's a development platform for secure mobile communications. So it's actually the precursor of the Be Trusted SOC. And the way this thing works, it's kind of PDA form factor you see there, is it's implemented on Xilinx FPGA using Vexus 5 and Litex. So I think recently we have all seen the supply chain attacks more on the software side that have been going on. Uh, from state-based actors. So what if these state-based actors were after you as you know a dissident and they could get into your hardware supply chain too? So Precursor talk about this as part of their, it's all on their crowd supply website, but as part of this, and you talk about how could you protect against that? So in this case, you could download the actual implementation onto your computer and build it yourself and download it to the FPGA yourself. So there's no man in the middle. No one at any point, you know, is attacking your, is, is you're not trusting anyone at any point, right? You designed it. I mean, you didn't have to design it, but you can audit it, verify it, and then flash it to the core. And that's what Bunny talks about on a lot of his blog posts. As well as that, we've also seen, you know, side channel attacks come out against CPU cores. And there was a recent one a few days before I recorded this that I think is really interesting. Um, but basically, with this, you can then say when that happens, update the implementation to avoid these problems. Uh, so it's a really cool concept. And again, the type of thing you couldn't do with traditional proprietary ISAs. So finally, I'm gonna talk about Omni Extend. So this is again, another example of the type of thing you couldn't have done with traditional proprietary closed royalty ISAs. Um, so here we have uh, Omni Extend is a cache coherent, open cache coherent interconnect. Um, so the way it works in this block diagram is we have these RISC V cores, we have their internal cache, or their, sorry, their internal um, switching, and then we can connect this serializer and send it over Ethernet. So this allows these two machines, or these two cores, to communicate over Ethernet all in hardware. So on one side we can have a machine learning accelerator, for example, on the other side we can have some main memory, and they can communicate over um, completely seamlessly to software through the hardware over a cache coherent uh, ethernet uh, packets so that can be switched. So it unleashes the memory from the CPU. There's no need to rewrite the software. Like I said, it's all handled in hardware. Now uh, it's based on ethernet. It already exists in FPGA implementations and it's the only open or completely open cache coherent fabric standard. Um, so it's all pretty exciting. This was talked about at the RISC V summit by one of my colleagues. So if you're interested, you should go watch his talk or you can find more details on the Chips Alliance website. Uh, but here we have um, kind of the FPGA board and we can use these implementations, like I said, of FPGA and we can use open ISAs to extend the hardware to allow things like this, to allow things like Omni Extend. So that's the end of my talk. I'm gonna hand it, probably hand it back over to Hugh uh, or some conclusion and thanks for listening to the risk part. Thanks. All right. Thanks again to Alistair for his uh, his session. Um, I'm going to seek to sort of historical me or pre prior me. 
uh, for a session I recorded a little earlier, uh, giving a bit of an update on uh, OpenPower. Hi, my name is Hugh Blemings, and I'm going to be providing a bit of an update on OpenPower in this part of today's talk. I do want to gratefully acknowledge that I'm presenting today on the traditional lands of the Gujichmara people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and leaders emerging. Thank you. So a little bit of a history of PowerPC and uh, I guess OpenPower generally. Uh, 1991 just um, saw the start of PowerPC uh, with Apple, Motorola and IBM coming together to build a RISC CPU. The uh, first uh, product release from that was in 1992, the PPC 601 which is a process used by both IBM and Apple in their systems of that, uh, of that era. 1995, signif significant for us, uh, that's when we saw the first ports of Linux to the PowerPC architecture, followed by 1998, where IBM released the Power 3, significant for being the first 64-bit PowerPC chip and the start of a series that actually continues to this day. There's also a little bit of side history there in the Power, P Power 3 chips and Power 4 uh, shortly thereafter, were the chips that um, where a lot of the 64-bit and large SMP work was done for the Linux kernel by the Ozabs team based in Canberra, Australia, which at the time I had the good fortune to, to work with. 2002, we see the uh, IBM PowerPC 970, aka the Apple G5, come to market. This is also significant, and it was the first time that PowerPC 64 was available for the masses, if you like, in the form of uh, Apple hardware of that, of that era. Really nice bits of kit, as it were, was then. Uh, 2005, sort of following hot on the heels from the, the year previous uh, with the Ni Nintendo GameCube, we had the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, both based on uh, PowerPC chips, uh, the Cell and Xenon CPUs respectively of that era. 2007 through 2013, uh, things kind of mostly considered, continued in the PowerPC and open power space at that point in the server side of things and some high-end workstations in the form of the Power 6, Power 7 and Power 8 parts that were released. In 2013, uh, the Open Power Foundation was formed, um, a bit more on that a little later in the, in the presentation, some history there, but that was a pretty important moment in the history of, uh, of PowerPC and when we first really came to be Open Power instead. 2017, uh, the IBM Power 9 was released and it uh, pretty much ate the x86 processors of that era for breakfast, uh, very high performance, very low electrical power part for the era and uh, so con remains competitive to this day. 2019 though I think was really the, the main, the, the big watershed moment uh, for uh, the Open Power, for Open Power, where IBM and Open Power worked together to release the Power ISA under a royalty free licence. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in some coming slides. The reason I wanted to put that so history in there just briefly was that I think that longevity of the power ecosystem uh, is actually really pretty important because uh, starting so long ago and having been around for uh, such a long time and, and evolved so cleanly has meant that we've ended up with a software ecosystem that's pretty uniquely stable, well thought out, well supported and uh, modern open power systems of all sizes draw on that same sort of lineage. That brings I guess a maturity and stability of the ecosystem I think is unique still in the open ISA, open ISA space. So on the Open Power ISA itself, uh, as I said, back in 20 August of 2019, IBM and Open Power uh, announced that the Power ISA was now available to use royalty free. This is the culmination of a couple of years' work, give or take, at that time to, to get us to that, that point. But um, it meant that uh, Power, ISA, Power ISA could be used for implementations and provided they, those implementations were compliant uh, with the ISA, the Open ISA, those implementations would also get a pass-through license for any IBM patents had relating to the ISA itself, which is quite a significant, provides quite a significant and useful degree of surety around the IP side of things. Uh, as it was announced back in August, back in 2019, the work group was to be stood up within within the foundation to oversee the ISA from there on, and that's uh, that that is now uh, now the case. This is also the group that would uh, determine the way in which changes could be made to the ISA from both. Uh, the external community, but also uh, Open Power members and, and member companies. IBM, of course, um, have a continue to have a, uh, a pivotal role in that. But they are, but the overall ISA itself is governed through the Open Power Foundation. One of the key things of uh, Open ISAs is trying to avoid fragmentation, and particularly 
in the case of open power where one of our key strengths has actually been the, the, the solidity and uh, maturity of the software ecosystem over time. So in order to uh, avoid fragmentation, there's some extra steps that are necessary should there be a propo change proposed that would break backwards compatibility and specifically that's a unanimous vote in the work group and some other measures that will be put in place to ensure that the, there isn't an inadvertent fragmenting of the, of the ISA that stayed uh, so solid and, and um, gets developed so cleanly over, over the years. Fast forward to uh, where we are with the Open Power ISA now. We have contributors from industry and the open source community. There's work groups set up. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, that in coming, in coming slides. So on the implementation, implementation side of things, I'll split it into, into th three broad categories, commercial impl implementations from scratch or community implementations and contributed implementations. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of those uh, as we, as we go in turn, but I guess the, the most obvious ones are the IBM Power 9 and Power 10, which are traditional standard uh, open um, commercial microprocessors, but leverage and are based off that same open power ISA that uh, is used for all the open implementations as well. I could not put this photo in. Uh, this is a photo of a Power 9 die. It remains one of my favourites, the bits of imagery from my, my entire time, at least recent times of working on the Power ISA. But I'll include it because it actually looks quite beautiful and unfortunately it's got my ugly mug up in the top corner. But nonetheless, it's a really beautiful, I think, um, reminder of just how intricate a modern microprocessor is. There's something of the order of 6 billion transistors in there. There are several kilometres of very, very small wires, uh, 14 nanometer process. When it's running at full clip, there's something a couple of hundred amps flowing through those very, very fine wires, albeit at low voltage and some clever heat dissipation, but only 100, 150 watts. Or so, but the point of showing it here as much as anything is to underscore. That I think it's a really, really exciting time for our open technical commons to contemplate that we are rapidly moving towards it. Indeed, we're almost at the point where we're able to produce devices of this complexity from ent using entirely open source tools and based ent entirely or largely on open source community efforts. It's a really pretty exciting time. So back on the implementations, MicroWatt was the first one uh, that uh, I'm going to cover here. And um, this was actually actually came about in uh, August 2019 as IBM was just about to announce the opening of the ISIS. One of the IBM engineers, uh, Anton Blanchard, thought, oh, it kind of be cool to have something to to show um, to release at the same sort of time. And, and well, you know, I've always been wanting to learn uh, VHDL. So whereas you or I might have just blinked the lead, uh, Anton sort of wandered off and... Um, over a period of a few months prior to the release, wrote a scratch from scratch implementation of the PowerPC 64-bit core. It was in, released as an integer fixed point only you know, implementation in VHDL uh, Creative Commons license, and it was very much intended at that point in time as a proof of concept. Here's what you can do. So I think, but since then it's kind of grown uh, in good ways. Got faster. Uh, it now has cache. It has memory management unit. It has privilege modes, interrupts, and interrupt controller and most recently a floating point unit, and indeed there's a whole talk elsewhere in the LCA program, this conf program uh, by Paul McCarris that talks about the evolution of MicroWatt. I, I commend that to you, I'll talk about it a bit more in a subsequent slide. From those humble beginnings of supporting just a single um, Xilinx Arctic 7 FPGA, MicroWatt now supports many FPGAs and uh, associated uh, development boards or test boards, the ECP5, uh, FPGA being one of the very common ones, ULX3S, uh, Orange Crab and Colour Light PCBs, uh, Greg Devil's or Orange Crab in particular is just an amazing very small piece of engineering, Colour Light boards are, are very cheaply available on all the usual uh, hardware sites and uh, are an interesting, an interesting test bed as well. In addition to tapping into the software ecosystem I touched on earlier that's been around over a period of, of, of some decades now and, and, and really quite mature, there's been some development specific to MicroWatt ports of MicroPython and Zephyr, uh, Rust and Pforth, for example, and then most recently uh, Linux uh, will boot on, on a micro on a MicroPython on a MicroWatt uh, CPU. MicroWatt, like uh, the majority of these implementations I'm talking about today, also builds in, on an entirely open source tool chain for most of the FPGA targets in in, uh, in question. Chiselwatt uh, is also a scratch built design, also Anton Blanchard's handiwork, and uh, but in this case it came about because uh, he was curious at learning about Chisel, so it's implemented in the Chisel HDL and released in January 2020. It's a very close cousin of MicroWatt, at least it was at the time it was, it, the project began, supports the same FPGAs and boards as MicroWatt does and architecturally is very, very similar 
and also builds on, on those same open source tool chains. It's been also released under a Creative Commons uh, license and is just another way to dip your toe into the uh, into the open power open power ISA. So LibreSoc's an interesting one. The LibreSoc project itself's primary focus is on on the Libre side of things, ethical tech, uh, open computing, open open uh, information, that sort of thing. So very uh, it, uh, very much focused on that Libre side of things. They set about building an SOC and in uh, early 2020 took the decision to switch to the Open Power ISA for their ongoing ongoing work. It's an entirely uh, Libre design that they're working on, written in MyGen. MyGen always get that wrong. Um, initially much of it was auto-generated directly from the ISA documentation itself, a uh, sort of combination of some clever scraping of data and, uh, and um, encoding to, to auto-generate a lot of the code, and then it's subsequently hand-optimised and it's been heavily hand-optimised since. The uh, integer implementation uh, running on an ECP5 passed the same test suite used um, for microwatt in November of, of last year, so really quite a short development cycle to go from mm, we think we should use open power to here is it working and um, quite a quite an effort on the part of all involved it's a novel architecture there's a whole bunch of information on their website which I, I commend to you if you're interested in digging into this but in particular their focus is um, having the GPU and CPU instruction streams uh, instructions in the same instruction stream and essentially having the CPU normally in open power mode and then it comes to a magic instruction flips into, oh, flips into GPU mode and then uh, switches back at, uh, at a later point when, when it sees the sees another instruction. They're um, taping it out in uh, due to tape out, and then I gather on track to tape out uh, a test ASIC in March of uh, of this year, and that and the overall the funding for that and the overall project itself it's um, done has been funded by the uh, NLNet Foundation, who is a, a European based uh, philanthropic organisation that supports open organisations and endeavours towards an open information society. They've got some really interesting future plans as well uh, in the form of a, a quad core SOC for, uh, should we say, Pi-like applications. Um, it's expected that will run to two and a half to three watts without a heatsink, making it quite a nice little, little part indeed. Switching gears slightly to the, so the uh, contributed uh, implementations, uh, there's, there's two. Um, the first of them is a, the A2I core, which uh, IBM released in June 2020, so a bit under a year ago. It's a derivative of a core used in various uh, IBM designs from, from a few years ago now, um, in particular their, some of their supercomputer systems uh, like BlueGene. It's a one to four thread in order design, which gives it the I in A2I. And written in Verilog, uh, Verilog being the, the lingua franca, if you like, of, uh, of uh, chip development at, at IBM, and um, has pretty good sort of range of on-chip resources. At our level two case, DDR3 memory controller, PCI Gen2. It is an older, older design, as I said, but whereas the overall chip design uh, is intended to be fed into uh, actual ch chip manufacturing tools to, to end up with a with a an actual pure silicon design. There is also the relevant um, extra pieces have been included so that it can be built for an FPGA target, and which makes it makes it easier to experiment with and um, to otherwise try out. Designed for high frequency, so applications three gigs plus at 45 nanometer, which was the, uh, the the technology of the day when it was um, when it was when it was first designed. But IBM done some modelling using their tools and uh, reckon on it running it comfortably over at three gigahertz at only 180 milliwatts, so you know, barely 0.2 of a watt. Uh, in a seven nanometer process, so quite a, a performant chip for a low electrical power input. And as a in-order design and sort of multi-thread, it was very, very much intended for towards throughput oriented sort of applications, so high memory bandwidth, just high bandwidth applications generally. A2O released a little later, uh, sort of from the same um, sort of lineage, I guess, uh, derivative of a core used in IBM. CPUs at one point, also written in Verilog, but it's an out of order design optimised for single thread performance. In particular, it can it can be one or two one or two cores as it's uh, currently currently conceived. Similar sort of set of peripherals, uh, similar sort of frequencies, though it can actually run a little faster, albeit high at uh, higher electrical power consumption, but rather more uh, compute. And as it suggests there, it's very much intended for more compute oriented um, 
compute oriented applications. It's my understanding um, that both A2I and A2O are being evaluated by, for commercial designs by, by a number of different companies around the world. It's a pretty exciting time. Just to digress a little bit for, for a minute or two, just to talk about some other interesting open power hardware that's uh, out there or, or, or coming, down the, coming down the pipe. The uh, Raptor uh, Blackbird and Talus 2 systems are Power 9 designs that be known to, to uh, many folk. Uh, I'm fortunate to uh, have a single socket Blackbird myself, really nice little machine. What's nice with these, they're all entirely uh, open source software stacks and entirely open hardware designs on these, so it leads to a very high degree of trust and auditability and indeed that's Raptor's focus for their businesses building on highly or building highly auditable user owner excuse me owner controlled uh, owner controlled systems to that end um, some pretty exciting new news and this will be public by the time this uh, gets um, uh, is uh, this talk is presented is um, the Kestrel soft BMC that Raptor have been working on this is a full featured soft uh, FPGA based BMC, BMC being the chip that does the, the control in a modern so server class and, and more sophisticated systems. It uses the next PNR software, next PNR open source development flow based running on PPC x64 LE, but it's an entirely open tool chain to actually do the, the uh, FPGA um, routing and compilation. But it runs a microwatt CPU core for the actual firmware in the device itself and running on an ECP5 it's now able to boot a Power 9 system like a Blackbird or a Talus 2 and in so doing it replaces the proprietary A-speed um, chip on those on those systems so it really gives you just another layer of openness in, in hardware of that kind and of course it can be applied to server class hardware of any kind. The code's released under the uh, under the AGPL v3 and, and all taken to, together gives a very high degree of assurance um, around that uh, security open, owner control and trust overall. There's a link there to Raptor's website if, you, if you'd like to find out more. Uh, the laptop, the common question. So the, the great crew at the Power Progress community uh, based out of Europe have been working on the PowerPC notebook for, for a couple of years now. It's a community-driven project. It's actually based on the, the NXP T2080, which while not technically open power, uh, in practice it is tapping into that same software ecosystem, but just the big Indian version of it and a slightly earlier version of the, of the ISA. Uh, when we t when I talked about this at LCA last year, 2020, um, the PCB design was uh, funding for the PCB design was sort of being kickstarted and just starting to take off. Uh, it's pleasingly that PCB's design is all but finalised at this point, and they've now moved to the point where they're crowdfunding the prototype, the first five uh, prototype systems that will be put together. Get more details there. Well worth a look. A really really interesting interesting project. There are some other sessions, as I mentioned, uh, on Open Power at LCA this year. Um, Microwatt grows up by Paul McCarris, talking about the history of Microwatt and uh, how it's evolved over over time. Jordan Neath is talking about some extensions to the Power ISA in Power 10 and the Open ISA itself that uh, simplify the addition of extra instructions uh, ex uh, uh, into the into the ISA. And then Jeremy Kerr, who's a, a frequent speaker at LCA, is, um, is talking about server platforms and experimenting with with your hardware there as well, and a lot of the examples to do with that are, are uh, open power, open power related. Uh -huh. So if we we're doing this for real, or uh, well, for real, if we we're doing this in person, uh, I'd actually be able to throw these stickers into the audience or pass these stickers around the around the room. Unfortunately, I can't. But um, if you would like a open power laptop sticker, um, please do drop me an email, find me on Twitter social media, what have you, and uh, I'll, I'll post one out to you uh, on behalf of yours truly and the, the Open Power Foundation. Don't much mind where you are, so wherever you're watching this, drop us a line and we'll, uh, we'll put, a, put a couple in the post on behalf of the, uh, the Foundation. Speaking of whom, the Open Power Foundation. So as I said uh, in the opening remarks, started in 2013 and the high level mission is to promote the Open Power ecosystem. Uh, better part of 350 odd members, a mixture of uh, individual academic and corporate members, it's a not-for-profit technical consortium and the overall mission is to promote open power uh, in, in all its different uh, forms and bring together the various different groups, individuals that are, that are part of that. You know, individual members are absolutely welcome. Um, please jump on their website and have a look at uh, look at what's what's going on in there and join us there. It would be, be great to have you on board. That pretty much closes uh, what I wanted to talk about just in the specific open power side of things, so I'll, uh, I'll finish off this recording and uh
be back in a, a few moments just with uh, some general closing remarks for the overall open ISA session again today. Thanks so much for your time. Alrighty. So thanks again to Alistair for pre preparing his session. Um, just a bit of a bit of a conclusion. I think, as I said in previous remarks, and indeed in my talk, that open source software has really proven that uh, open is the way to go for security, flexibility, and performance. And I believe the success of open source software, it really does tell tell us that uh, in time, if not already, uh, similar success for open hardware will be no different. It's all but an inevitability. Um, it really is a rapidly moving area, and this was kind of driven home in many ways by the fact that not long after Alistair had recorded uh, his talk, um, the Beagle 5 was announced, which is a great looking little uh, Linux capable RISC 5 board uh, that just was announced barely a few days ago, but after Alistair had recorded his talk. Um, and in a similar vein, uh, the crew at uh, Raptor Engineering, who are one of the Open Power Foundation members, announced their Kestrel BMC, an entirely Libre open power based BMC for, for modern systems, which is also a very interesting uh, piece of technology. To wrap up, uh, I do extend my thanks to Alistair uh, for his assistance and um, in putting all this together and putting his, his, his section together and some useful feedback uh, for all of it. And of course, thanks to all of you out there uh, for watching. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And um, if you have any follow-up questions or whatever, please do reach out to Alistair or I. We'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for your time. Alistair, uh, your talk was great. I got to watch most of it, um, and I agree that it's a really exciting time. Uh, coming up now, we've got a lunch break. Um, our lunch break is going for about an hour, and at about 1.30 Melbourne time, we're going to be back here with Kieran Gibson to talk about, about PowerShell in Linux. That is going to be really interesting. We look forward to seeing you there in about an hour.